Hello, and welcome to Zoe Shorts, the bite-sized podcast where we discuss one topic around science and nutrition. I'm Jonathan Wolfe, and today I'm joined by Dr. Will Bolsewich. And today's subject is irritable bowel syndrome. IBS, Jonathan. It's more common than you might think, but still very misunderstood. Why is it so common, Will? And yet no one seems to really understand what it is. In fact, what is it exactly? And how is it different from bowel diseases? Those questions are complicated to answer, as it turns out. There's a mysterious mind-body connection when it comes to your old bowel syndrome. Intriguing. Let's get into it. Okay, Jonathan, let's jump in our DeLorean for a moment, and we're going to travel back to, of all places, a medical school in the late 1800s. Why? That's when IBS was first discovered. It was a Canadian physician, uh, a very famous physician, someone who I learned about in medical school. His name is Sir William Osler. And if you could just picture a big white mustache and a pocket watch, that's kind of the imagery that we have. So he was one of the best known physicians at the time. And in 1892, he coined the term mucus colitis. And what he was referring to was a digestive condition that involved a combination of abdominal colic or abdominal pain and the passing of mucus in the stool. And today, this has been uh, recognized as being the early definition of irritable bowel syndrome. And I guess the fact that it was so long ago explains why this name irritable bowel syndrome sounds a bit like an 80s rock band. Um, I'm assuming that uh, since then we've learned a lot, uh, Will. So what exactly do we think IBS is today? It's, it's a group of symptoms that happen together. And so basically you have to start with having abdominal pain. And that abdominal pain will occur alongside some sort of change in the bowels. So it could be diarrhea, constipation, or a combination of both. Now, the symptoms of IBS may change over time, but IBS is often lifelong. This is not something that you can just cure with antibiotics or something like that. But it's something that you can manage. It's something you can manage to the point that it doesn't necessarily affect your quality of life. IBS is interesting because although it's a bowel disease, it doesn't increase your risk of developing bowel cancer or other bowel-related issues. The mystery around IBS is that even though this is so common, we don't know exactly what causes it. Although I will say we have some strong clues that we'll talk about today. And Will, it's really common, right? So um, we looked at the latest data and IBS affects about one in 10 people worldwide. Uh, in North America, it's estimated that 10 to 15 percent of the population have it. Uh, it's less prevalent in people aged over 50, uh, and it's also more likely to affect women than men. Um, and as some listeners may know, I suffered from fairly mild IBS in my 20s uh, and into my 30s. So it's something that you know I have personal experience uh, with and is quite close to my heart. So can we start, Will, by looking at some of those classic IBS symptoms? Um, and I think that those often consist of sort of the stomach pain combined with a sort of change in bowel movements. So in other words, not sort of the regular movement that, you know, we all would like to be having when we go to the toilet. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think we have to start by saying that abdominal pain is a core part of this diagnosis. So if you don't experience any abdominal pain or discomfort, then it's not IBS, although you may still be experiencing diarrhea or constipation. Uh, it can come with different experiences for different patients. So for example, some may experience a discomfort or pain that's sharp and intense. Others have these cramps that sort of seem to come in waves, like it builds up and then relieves. Or others have symptoms more like bloating or even a burning discomfort. So individuals with IBS, they can, they can have other coinciding symptoms like uh, gurgling of the stomach or the feeling of incompletely evacuating their bowels after a bowel movement or even the passage of mucus in the stool, which is what Dr. Osler was referring to. So, Will, I mean, none of these things sound like fun. Um, and we've also discussed a lot of different digestive health issues um, on the show. And some of those symptoms overlap with some of the things you were just describing. So, you know, if a listener is listening to this right now, you know, how can you tell if these symptoms add up to IBS? And, you know, could you maybe talk us through how it's normally diagnosed? 
Sure. So we have to start with the basics, which is that IBS is a pattern of symptoms and we call it irritable bowel syndrome. The word syndrome being really key there for a reason. And that's because we have to use criteria uh, to diagnose IBS. There's no specific blood test or x-ray or poop test to diagnose IBS. This is actually the key in a way, Jonathan, which is that there's no definitive definitive test as you've measured uh, mentioned. So ultimately, in order to diagnose IBS, you have to fulfill specific pattern-based criteria. And the criteria that we use are called the Rome criteria. Now, this has been revised. It started with Rome 1. Now we're up to Rome 4. So this is the fourth version. What does the Rome 4 criteria then say? Okay, so in order to qualify under the criteria, you need to have first recurrent abdominal pain at least one day per week in the last three months. And then in addition to that, you need to have at least two specific changes that relate to your bowel movements. One is that there's uh, an association of your symptoms with your bowel movement. For the majority of people who have IBS, Jonathan, they will experience improvement of their symptoms after they go to the loop. A second possible possibility is a change in the stool frequency. And then the third is change in stool appearance. So basically changes with the bowel movements, changes in stool frequency, changes in stool appearance. You need at least two of those. And are there different types of IBS? Indeed, there are. Uh, there's four types, actually. So IBSD stands for diarrhea, um, man meaning that the abnormal bowel movements are usually diarrhea. Then we have IBSC. I, I think I can guess this one. I'm guessing this means constipation, right? That is correct. Uh, and then there's IBSM for mixed, which is, of course, a mix of both diarrhea and constipation. And then the last one, uh, which is actually quite, quite rare, but it's IBSU, which means unclassified. And these are patients who haven't met the technical criteria for IBS uh, in terms of diarrhea or constipation. So they really can't be slotted into one of these other three types. Got it. All right. So take me into, you know, the doctor's office, like your office during one of these diagnoses. Well, so the first thing is that the clinician is going to start with a comprehensive history and physical examination. And this is an opportunity for the patient to really describe these symptoms in, in full detail. Now, pain, diarrhea, constipation, they're also symptoms of other conditions, which, you know, you've talked about, Will, on previous podcasts. So what's the risk of misdiagnosing here? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point, Jonathan, because IBS, you know, one of the important things from my perspective as a medical doctor is to make sure that you're not missing something else. There's a number of different conditions that can masquerade and sound just like IBS. And yet, if it's something else, you're not, you're not treating your patient appropriately until you make that diagnosis and then target that in terms of your treatment. So, one of the things that doctors will do is they'll look for red flag symptoms. And this helps the doctor to realize that there may be something more going on here beyond just run of the mill irritable bowel syndrome. The red flag symptoms include unexplained weight loss, anemia, seeing blood in the stool, having diarrhea in the middle of the night, having progressive and intensifying abdominal pain. And then we also get a little more cautious in people beyond age 50 or who have a family history of inflammatory bowel disease or uh, bowel cancer, because in those cases, you just don't want to miss those possibilities. And I know that in my case, and this is now almost 30 years ago, that the doctors did a lot of investigations to make sure that I didn't have any bowel diseases. And I remember it was an enormous relief to discover that it wasn't cancer, which I've been really scared about, or some major bowel disease. Now, what are some of the alternatives to IBS you know, today that a doctor might be looking for? So there's a number of possibilities. Of course, the doctor is going to individualize what they're doing to what the patient is reporting to them. But some of the ones that I would classically think about include chronic infections. So things like C. diff infection or Giardia. Um, I always would have a very high level of suspicion for the possibility of celiac disease because it can sound just like IBS. You have to think about food intolerances. So it could be lactose intolerance. It could be a FODMAP intolerance or a sucrose intolerance. You could also have small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Uh, people know this as SIBO. 
or you could have an inflammatory bowel disease, which includes conditions like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or something called microscopic colitis. And could it in fact be as simple as chronic constipation? It could. Uh, it's interesting because not everyone who has constipation has IBS, but everyone who has IBS-C has constipation. And there are even several patterns of constipation that can masquerade as other forms of IBS. Sneaky. So how does that work, Will? Well, uh, I'm specifically thinking about IBSD or even IBSM, the mixed IBS, because I actually think in many cases, these are constipation. Let me give you a quick example, Jonathan. Someone could have zero bowel movements for uh, several days in a row. And then all of a sudden they have this one day where the first bowel movement comes and it's formed, but then they keep having more and more bowel movements as the day goes on. And the, the, the bowel movements, they get looser and looser to the point of being water. So this person, they think they have diarrhea, but it's from my perspective, this is actually constipation. So they're sort of backed up for days until they're sort of effectively set to explode. Yeah, uh, to put it delicately, Jonathan. Okay, not a not a technical term. Okay, so um, you know maybe maybe coming to to my own experience, I was diagnosed with IBS in my early twenties, so um, a little more than twenty five years ago, after I had been very sick with with glandular fever, which is mononucleosis for for you will in the states, um, for sort of six months, and at that time. You know, I remember this really well. None of the gastroenterologists that I saw thought that any of the microbes in our gut mattered at all. This is basically pre the time when the microbiome had been discussed, discovered. Um, so at the time, they were basically convinced that IBS was probably largely caused by stress. And that basically, if you could get yourself really relaxed, then probably this would solve most of this problem. Um, uh, is that a real thing still today, or is that a myth from a time before we understood the importance of our, of our gut bacteria and just sort of the complexity of what was going on inside our gut? When it comes to the connections between stress and the manifestations in our gut, there, are very, there is very clearly a psychological element to IBS. In fact, Jonathan, one study found that patients with IBS reported more lifetime and daily stressful events than control groups. That's interesting. And Will, does this mean that stress is a cause or just a result of an unhappy gut? Because, you know, again, thinking back to when I had this, like if you've got a really bad stomach and it may be impacting your quality of life, I mean, you're going to feel stressed as a re result of this. Which way round is it? Looking at the data, stress has been linked to the onset of symptoms and then the symptoms improve when the stress is gone. So there's that. And another study found that patients with IBS showed increased levels of anxiety, depression, and phobias. Um, so I think that there's sort of a little bit of both going on here, Jonathan. Which I have learned in everything to do with the human body is is common, right? It's never as simple as one thing. So, so the, the team who looked at this found a recent study, very recent study from 2021 of over 50,000 people with IBS around the world. Uh, and the researchers in that study found that people with IBS were more likely to have anxiety. And when I think back to where my symptoms were, were really bad, which is sort of right at the beginning of my early 20s, I was definitely, you know, I mean, maybe not medically depressed by this, but definitely, you know, depressed by this in, in sort of common language. And, um, and I thought what was interesting is the study also found that people with both IBS and anxiety were more likely to have been treated frequently with antibiotics during childhood. And the study authors suggested that repeated use of antibiotics during childhood might increase the risk of IBS and anxiety by altering the normal gut bacteria, which in turn influences nerve cell development and mood. The team was very careful though to say that this doesn't necessarily mean that anxiety causes IBS symptoms or vice versa. It's just that these things are very much interconnected. It's hard to separate them. And I know one of the things I was amazed to discover is like this huge amount of nerves and immune system control in our gut, right? So actually the brain and the gut, they really are linked. It's not just one of those things that, uh, that, that people say. Oh, 100%. So, Will, we've gone over what IBS is, how it's diagnosed, the role that stress and anxiety might play. What about how to manage symptoms if, you know, any of our listeners are saying, you know, I think I do have IBS or indeed I've been diagnosed with it? 
Yeah, so first of all, to those listeners, you have to understand treatment is always going to be individualized. Um, so it, it's a little bit hard to completely generalize when, you know, IBSD and IBSC are sort of different things in terms of how you attack them. But there are some general rules that we can use, and that's what I wanted to address today. Some patients see improvement in their symptoms very quickly if they take these simple steps. Cut out caffeine, alcohol, and spicy and fatty foods. That's funny. I remember being told very specifically to cut out broccoli. <laughs> well, that's uh, discriminatory against broccoli, but nonetheless, there there is this... Um, there, there is also the concept of the low FODMAP diet, Jonathan, which is usually a secondary thing. Tell us what a low FODMAP diet is, Will. FODMAP is a very nerdy thing. Stands Standing for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. That's a real mouthful, if you'll excuse the pun. Yeah, it, it basically means different types of sugar that the small intestine struggles to absorb. The idea is that you will temporarily reduce these foods or temporarily eliminate these foods so that you can gather an understanding of what's happening with your body. And Will, what are the sort of things that you would cut out if you were doing this? Um, you may start with things like milk and ice cream, wheat, beans, lentils, even some fruit and veggies like onions and apples and garlic, again, all temporary. But you can also start with a much more limited version where you would temporarily restrict dairy and gluten-containing products. And what about supplements or anything else that we can take for IBS instead of like effectively excluding things? So there's been mixed evidence, um, but there are some that stand out in terms of potentially being helpful. So one is peppermint oil. Uh, peppermint oil seems to really help in terms of abdominal discomfort and bloating. The, the menthol seems to have a soothing effect on the small intestine. There was also a 2014 paper showing that probiotics can improve IBS symptoms. Now, in this paper, they said the quality of the existing studies is limited. And as a gastroenterologist, I would agree with that. Probiotics are not the solution for everyone. But when you find the right probiotic, it can actually be very helpful for many people. And the last thing that I would say is that I've had great success with, with some fiber supplements, specifically psyllium husk or soluble fiber supplements, Jonathan. Amazing. So it's nice to know there's some things that one can try. Um, now, away from dietary measures, I also heard that acupuncture can help. It's interesting, Jonathan. A, a 2009 clinical trial of 230 participants with IBS found that those who received acupuncture actually did better than those who did not. Another thing you could try is mindfulness. This can be very helpful to some people. And this, this could be as simple as doing breathing exercises. I've had great success as well, Jonathan, using something called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Now, this is something I usually use in addition to medical treatments. And of course, we should mention that there are medications that are commonly used for IBS. Now, I'm not a fan of just medications. I think we should be including these other things. But there are some that are really effective. And something that's interesting is that we have sort of repurposed many of the medications that were developed to treat depression. We are uh, using to treat irritable bowel syndrome, but we use them at a much lower dose. So when it comes to medicines, once again, um, you have to make choices based upon the person's individual's, individual needs. And so, Will, what if someone's listening to this, they've been diagnosed with IBS, they've changed their diet, they've changed some of their treatments, but things are still not getting better? You know, this is such a big topic and there's so much that we could talk about here, Jonathan. But one of the things that I would say is that people should, if you have your old bowel syndrome, or frankly, even if you don't, we should all be orienting our diet and lifestyle towards supporting the gut microbiome. Because ultimately, the gut microbiome plays a central role in the development of IBS. I think that we've made that clear in our conversation today. And therefore, our solution should include centrally a focus on improving and elevating the gut microbiome. Now, there are some people that in particular I've taken care of through the years, Jonathan, who like they've literally tried everything. And these people are desperate and they're just not getting better. Their quality of life is, you know, in, in shambles. And when this is the case, typically my first approach is to ask the question, is this really IBS? Because if you can identify an alternative cause, 
that may be the solution to fixing the problem. That may be why you're not getting better. Another thing that people should consider is the power of the brain gut connection. Yeah, throughout my career, Jonathan, I have witnessed this so many times where the connections between our digestive issues and our mood or having a history of trauma can actually be fueling these problems. So it's interesting, but sometimes the solution isn't actually just treating the gut. Sometimes the solution is also addressing that psychological factor that's holding you back. So Will, you know, coming to the conclusion here, is IBS mainly in our heads, as some people have suggested? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's that that's to me absurd as a gastroenterologist. But you know, what we do know is that there is this brain gut connection that is really relevant to irritable bowel syndrome. And when we're approaching this issue, we have to start by looking at the symptoms that are used to diagnose IBS. Follow the Rome 4 criteria and make sure that those symptoms are not actually some other condition that it's masquerading as IBS. So we have to think about these other things like celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease. Now, stress is a factor here and there are links to anxiety. So let's bear in mind the power that exists between the gut and the brain and how they are interacting. And when it comes to developing our treatment strategies, Ultimately, I, I sincerely believe that dietary modification should be a part of the approach for every single patient who has this issue, that we should strive to elevate and improve the health of our gut microbiome. But also, when we need medicine or when we need supplements, we shouldn't be bashful about that. We should take advantage of those possibilities to improve our symptoms and our quality of life. And don't lose sight of these other things that can be beneficial, like diaphragmatic breathing, acupuncture or cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, that was amazing. Thank you, and I can tell that we could have spent five times longer on this. I'm sure this is a, a topic we'll come back to in the future. Uh, if based on today's program, you'd like to try Zoe's personalized nutrition program to improve your health, maybe manage your weight, you can get 10% off by going to joinzoe.com slash podcast. I'm Jonathan Wolf, And I'm Will Bolsowitz. Join us next week for another Zoe podcast.